So uh, this time, uh, last time I spoke about urban renewal, and this time I wanted to talk to you briefly about uh, rethinking topology and especially the uh, art depot that we have just uh, completed in Rotterdam. I'm really sorry that I don't speak Italian, but uh, I hope you can follow my English. Let's see. Um, first, uh, I want to show you two other small pro uh, projects, or very briefly, uh, where we also have been rethinking typologies. It's something that we have been doing since the 90s, uh, where we request uh, um, a debrief of the client and a typology, and then we try to, uh, to come to some kind of innovation. For example, this building in Amsterdam, the Silodam, which was uh, designed and built in the 90s, uh, we felt that this really big volume uh, would put quite some pressure on the neighborhood if you would have uh, 500 people with the same demographic background. And so what we uh, were trying to do is instead of having just one building uh, with the same kind of people, we wanted to add to this neighborhood an entire uh, yeah, um, how do you say, like perhaps an average of the neighborhood. So a big mix of uh, different lifestyles and people. So we made this diagram where you can see that we have uh, all kinds of different uh, lifestyles, uh, senior housing, studios for students, uh, very big villas, family homes, but also uh, social housing, all mixed together in one building. Uh, and that actually ended up being a community. The facade uh, we designed in a way that you also see these different uh, uh, typologies behind uh, this facade. And I think it's very important that we don't uh, impose uh, one group on a neighborhood that we are trying to always have uh, different lifestyles in one building, uh, which we think it's important because society in the end will benefit uh, if we mix uh, the population rather than that we uh, live in separation or even apartheid from each other. Um, also in Market Hall in Rotterdam in 2014, we have tried to reinvent uh, a typology. Uh, the market, uh, which is usually a building, uh, you have much more of those market halls in Italy than we do. Uh, they're usually quite cheaply built, uh, quite often in steel and wood. And we, um, uh, we wanted to have a much taller market hall, but there was no budget for it. And so we used a, a trick almost. We, uh, we used two apartment buildings as walls, one layer of penthouses as a ceiling and as a by effect, a side effect, we have this glorious market hall with a very big art piece, 11,000 square meters. So inside the market, you have 100 stands where you can buy food, but also 18 restaurants are in the, in the hall. And then it is uh, uh, yeah, arched over by this apartment building and a large basement with uh, car parking. And you can live in Market Hall and you can actually see into the market. And this is a very new uh, way of living uh, in the city of Rotterdam. And it's also a new way of having a Market Hall. So uh, when we then uh, were asked to uh, um, enter a competition uh, to rethink an art depot, we felt like this was a very good uh, project for us, uh, very suitable. Um, the competition was about the art depot of the Museum Boymans von Bernie which is in Rotterdam. It is a museum which is uh, very holistic. It has lots of objects from uh, the Stone Age until modern art. It has furniture, it has objects, it has sketches, it has paintings and so on. It was collected by uh, the people that got rich in the port of Rotterdam and they at a certain moment donated their art collection and even this building that you can see here to the city of Rotterdam. So today uh, the collection is a municipal art collection. The building is old, it's from the 1930s and it is at a very low point in the city of Rotterdam which is below sea level and there were always uh, problems with water. The building has basements but the basements are not very watertight. So what you would see especially in summer these days when there was a lot of rain, uh, uh, the museum director, you see him here uh, in the basement uh, during a summer rain, uh, it floods, the fire department had to come pump out the basement and priceless objects of art were only centimeters away from the uh, water. On the other, on the left side, you see one of the most famous uh, paintings uh, of Museum Boymans von Berningen, which is of course also very interesting for architects 
It's by a boy called the Tower of Babylon. Well, what a museum would normally do and what the city of Rotterdam wanted to do, they wanted to build a box uh, to keep the art safe. And, uh, this uh, storage uh, should contain 151 objects, but the museum director felt that it would be a bad thing to put the art collection onto a, uh, on, in, into suburbia and uh, close it off. He had a very different vision. But you see, art depots usually are these kind of buildings. They look like prisons. They don't need windows. They have big fences around them. It's all very secured because the, uh, the value inside is immense. However, uh, the director, Charles X, thought that the 151,000 art pieces he can never show. So only 4% of the entire collection would ever be visible to the public and 96% would always be in a depot. And he wanted to have 100% available for the people of Rotterdam. So he was dreaming to have an open art depot for the people of Rotterdam. Now the city didn't have the money for it, but he was very lucky and he found a foundation that, have, that gave him the money. And the foundation said, uh, as a condition, you have to build this new uh, public art depot in a surrounding of 200 meters around the old museum. Now, the only place where we could do this uh, was the park uh, right next to the museum, which was designed by Rem Kohlhans and Yves Brunier, a very difficult location. Nobody really wanted to build a building there, but we entered the competition against three other architects and we had to deal with this site. Here you see the site. It is surrounding, surrounded by lots of neighbors. First, we had to leave uh, uh, an axis of culture, but also for cycling. And then uh, they asked us to put 15,400 square meters of program to the site. No basement because it's very, very wet there. So you see it's a massive building, really big uh, to house all the art. And uh, for the competition, uh, there was a financial aspect, uh, which is always a bit nasty in a competition, of course. But if we would be above budget, we would be disqualified. So we started with a dream first. We would come with uh, um, something that looks like a table, symbolizing safety of the water. So you would help bring the art up onto a level. And even if the country would flood, uh, the art would be safe. Uh, but that was way too expensive, so we couldn't do it. At a certain moment, we dumped down our design until we only sent in this box. And even that one was too expensive. We did then a analysis, what are the most expensive parts of the buildings? Obviously the air conditioning, seven different uh, climate zones. So, uh, but we couldn't save on that. But also the facade in a very high security because uh, inside seven billion euro worth of art. So uh, super strong concrete. But here we could actually save some money by making it a cylinder. And the cylinder uh, was really fantastic because suddenly there was some budget left. So we could also make it look like a sculpture in the garden. We minimized the footprint of the, uh, of the building. We maximized the roof. We gave it a, an elegant, elegant shape. And also uh, suddenly there was no more backside. So we could be polite to all the neighbors. We have a big panoramic roof terrace. And as you can see here, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, you can uh, see around it and uh, the neighbors all have the same view. It would look like a sculpture in the garden. Uh, we also were dreaming about a reflection so that it would be like the bean in Chicago, that this massive building in the garden would be less visible because it would reflect the garden. It would also allow you to look around the corner. It would also dissolve towards the top uh, because you have uh, then the sky as a reflection. And uh, at night, you could then see inside uh, in the few image uh, windows that actually the building does have. Um, we had a lot of protest against the removal of the trees. So the trees were not harmed. They were actually replanted elsewhere in the city. And we promised that we would put new trees on top of the roof. So uh, that, was, uh, that was very good. After that, the protest stopped. And here is how we then envisioned and also how we won the competition for Boymans von Berningen. You see the sculpture in the garden that you can approach. You see yourself, you see the garden. If you are inside, you see that it is not a museum, but it is a art depot. You can walk in spontaneously. You can also book a tour. And the moment you go in, you see a lot of art in storage. One big atrium filled with art pieces. 
uh, that you can uh, can see. You can, uh, uh, in advance, you can go onto the website of the depot and you can make a rendezvous with an art piece, or you can do it all spontaneously, however you want. So, um, into the big uh, uh, painting depots, you need to have a tour guide. You can go there with 14 people for 10 minutes. After that, uh, the air conditioning needs to uh, uh, be uh, better and the light needs to go out so that the art doesn't suffer. But as you can see, the guide can tell you exactly, uh, show you exactly the art piece that you have ordered. So that was the, the general idea. It is an art depot, not a museum, so you will be seeing how art has been uh, shipped and put in crates, how the museum is testing this place for the, uh, the real museum, how people are uh, renovating uh, uh, art. You will be able to see the people that are normally invisible in the museum at work. So for them, it's a big lifestyle change. They were always uh, behind the, uh, <laughs> the stage, if you want, and now they have to work uh, in front of public. On the top, there is a restaurant and a sculpture garden with birch trees, uh, as you can see here, very beautiful. And this is how we basically won the competition. And then we were able to build it. Uh, we uh, pour, poured it on site, the first uh, lower levels. There is also on the, on the ground floor, there is no art, so that if the city ever floods, uh, uh, there would be no damage to the art. The art only starts at eight meters height. And then uh, in the higher regions, we worked with prefab concrete. The black, as you can see here, is insulation because the building is one big fridge. It has a, a Briam uh, 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 label. So it's uh, uh, for a building that has so heavy uh, uh, air conditioning, it's not even that bad. Uh, and then we started to uh, clad it with the mirror, as you can see here. Already you see the, uh, you look towards the east and you can see the sunset in the west in a reflection with the skyline of Rotterdam. And here you see the reflection of the museum. It's now almost done. We gave it to the museum and the museum then first needed six months to dry the building so that the air conditioning is working. And at this moment, they are busy to move in the art. And for this period of six months until they open in November, the building is closed. But I was very, very lucky because last week, we had uh, visitors, very important visitors. I'm not allowed to tell you who they are, but they uh, suddenly opened the building and I was allowed to show them the building so I could go inside. And first on the approach, you saw how a truck actually goes into the loading dock. Uh, in the end, it totally disappeared. Uh, a steel shutter came down and so the truck was safe. The art was safe inside. And then it first goes into the quarantine and into the security. The quarantine and security are closed for the public, but all the other spaces are open to the public. So 95% of the building is public, which is the first time ever in a, in a public art depot that uh, you reach this high uh, percentage. Inside, you have the big atrium, which looks a little bit like, like an Escher or maybe a Piranesi with crisscrossing stairs. And you see that uh, it's not all the art yet in here. You see no art yet but you see how the natural light comes in from the top. Uh, you can walk around the atrium on every level. Uh, there is also a really big uh, art uh, elevator that brings the art into this atrium. And uh, you see on both sides windows and the windows uh, show you the uh, access to the depots. Interesting is that it's not only the art collection of the museum, but also private art collections, for example, a big telephone company has put its art collection into the depot and they will also open this art collection for the public, which is nice because this private art collection is really wonderful. Now here you see into one of the, uh, the object depots, you can walk there uh, around and while you walk there suddenly um, uh, people come with a huge Mondrian painting. You see that here, uh, they, they ask you to uh, step back, but then you can follow them into the uh, painting depot and see how they hang it up. Here you see one of the depots for the uh, for art pieces, objects. You see lots of uh, uh, Marys uh, uh, up there in the shelf and other art pieces. So it's like a treasure room. It's really, really fantastic what it does. You see the, the, the strangest objects. You see furniture, 
art pieces. Also here, for example, uh, uh, we were attracted to this art piece, which looks like an airplane and also a, a person, a man and a woman. A very strange object it was, and uh, you don't know who is the artist if you don't know uh, uh, too much about art. But you go there, you look at it, and what was really impressive is how it collided with the black dress that was right next to it. Because uh, those two would normally not be together in an exhibition. Uh, the black dress therefore gained an enormous elegance uh, uh, next to this uh, pink object. And we all enjoyed this, uh, this clash of two art pieces that don't belong together. So uh, you have a lot of these meetings in the, in the depot. Well, one of the guests was very interesting to see this art. And here you see one of the people of the museum who are allowed to actually touch the art, uh, removing the protective cover and showing that there was a, an art, a car underneath that is an art piece, which is made like a couch uh, of soft leather. Uh, very, very beautiful. And uh, the guests were very uh, excited to be able to see this. And uh, then you go into the painting depots and you see so many paintings in one go. It's not even full yet, but there is an abundance that hits you. It's like being on Google image uh, view, or it's like you walk through the Western uh, history of art through all the periods uh, uh, in one go and everything is uh, in a chaos because they put it not up uh, according to, um, uh, to the period or the style of the art, but basically only about, it's all about practicalities and climate, it's about the climate and it's about the size of the art pieces. Very, uh, very parametric and rational, but this also allows you to see things that would never be next to each other. And uh, that was uh, really funny and very rich in an experience, but a very different experience. Here, for example, you see a Roy Lichtenstein or a small piece of it and lots of other art that you don't know. So you go there and you cannot see who made this and what is it. All you can see is your own experience. Do I like it? Do I appreciate it? Do I not like it? So you're very much uh, left alone with this art and the art has to stand and express for itself, which is really uh, uh, beautiful as well. So in this experience, the depot is not a competition to the normal museum. It is an addition, addition to it. It, uh, it does something very, very different uh, than, the, uh, uh, than the museum. So here you see uh, lots, of, lots of classic paintings, how they put up uh, modern paintings and so on. A bit of the practicalities here, you see how um, they're still filling the racks uh, and uh, they're mixing lots of things. Here you see a Torop, a very beautiful uh, painting that people liked. The nice thing is that the staff can actually give you a personal tour so they can uh, move the racks out. So here very nicely, he moved out a rack where the, you had four of these paintings and one of them was a Monet. And suddenly you are in front and confronted by a Monet that uh, would always stay in the depot normally. And you can have a look at it and uh, that was a really touching, almost emotional uh, moment for us to see these paintings uh, so privately. Also, you walk around the corner and there you have uh, almost uh, random this painting by Hendrik Averkamp, which is maybe not known in Italy, but it's very famous in the Netherlands because it's a, a range of Christmas cards and suddenly it's, it's hanging there. And then you realize how much the Christmas cards are photoshopped, but still how wonderfully beautiful it is to have this encounter with this art piece. And after you've seen the art, uh, the abundance, 150,000 objects, you can go to the roof and you can see uh, the city of Rotterdam from above. And you can see uh, this new forest that was planted and also uh, your own reflection in the, uh, in the walls of the restaurant, uh, which is uh, all around uh, uh, on, the, on the top floor. Yeah, so uh, this was a very nice and emotional experience that uh, that we had. And uh, from November onwards, uh, uh, visitors will be able to uh, uh, to visit uh, uh, this building because then it is uh, going to be open uh, for public. Thank you very much. I hope this was in time. And I wonder whether you have some questions.
Thank you, thank you, Jan. Uh, I think there is some question for you and uh, from the chat and uh, Leonora will read. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me fine? I can hear you, yes. So Valentina asks, uh, thank you, this project is a real challenge and it looks very interesting, especially in the way people can interact with the works of art. Nevertheless, I wonder if they kept any trace of the landscape project by Cole Haas and Yves Bournier, pardon my pronunciation. We have not so many projects left by Brunier. Uh, I see they dealt with the issue of keeping trees and respect the neighborhood, but I would like to know more about the relation with the previous project by Colhas and Brunier. Yes, the place where the depot is built uh, used to be the entrance. The, uh, the park uh, by Yves Brunier and Colhas is a series of gardens. And one of the gardens was changed. The rest of the park is not touched and not changed. And uh, there was a big debate whether this was fine. Cole has said it's not a catastrophe, um, but uh, actually the, uh, some people liked it, others were um, against the change. But the thing is that in this part of the park, uh, the, the trees were never really growing. The idea was initially that there would be an orchard with fruit trees, uh, but then the city used the wrong kind of uh, uh, um, ground, so they put uh, um, shells in and the, the, the trees died. The next batch of trees that were planted, they were too wet, so uh, they were also slowly dying and they have now been saved and are in a different part of the, of the, of the city. So um, this entrance to the um, to the Kohas uh, Park has been altered and changed. Also, we, we, we uh, made the park bigger. So uh, a street was, uh, was removed and uh, a landscape from England. I just lost the name, but they, they actually made the park uh, uh, a little bit bigger um, so uh, that we don't lose any greenery. But it was quite a different and challenging uh, project to build in this park, and of course, it's never, it's never very, um, yeah, grateful to destroy somebody else's uh, uh, work in this way. But it was the only location that the city had uh, given. Thank you, Yang. Thank you. I I believe that answered Valentina's question. There is one more. If you have five minutes for us. Sure. Okay, so Patricia Cupeiro Lopez asks, the strategy of the trees was really clever. People has been has been heard. And that's that's always important. Very thoughtful project and very nice results. That's how museums work. It's nice to have people there to visit so they realize all the works and care that it takes how and the work and care that it takes, sorry. And how curators and museum staff put on their collections. It wasn't a question as much as a as much as much as a comment, sorry. Uh, but there is another question from Santo Giurna, Gi Giunta, sorry, University of Palermo. He wonders whether you are familiar with the Sala del Dubbio in Palazzo Abatellis by Carlo Scarpa. I don't know no. where that is though. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm familiar with the Soans Museum in London, yeah, maybe you know yeah, that, where you also have a rich abundance of art put together, but it's more sorted. Whereas in the depot, the art is really yeah. uh, put in, in terms of practicality because it's not a museum. And I think yes. this really uh, is, uh, is a very new way of, uh, of looking at art. And I was a bit ashamed because I must say that the uh, the more classical art for me worked much better in this surrounding, whereas some of the modern art looked a bit like, like uh, a charity shop. And uh, you, I could see that modern art uh, perhaps needs the, the the holes of the museum much more than the classical art because it has this this golden frame that already uh, gives it a lot of uh, stature. Where whereas uh, the modern arts somehow to me it felt like it needed to be much more supported by uh, by architecture so that almost like the modern art pieces quite a few of them didn't survive in this uh, perhaps more uh, technical surrounding uh, of the storage that was a very very interesting thing i hope that uh, that you go there and that you can uh, that you have a, 
a, a very different experience. Uh, it will be very, very interesting to, to hear experiences from people. Absolutely. I hope that we can all travel to Rotterdam very soon and by all means after it opens in November. Mm -hmm. By the way, they tell me that Palazzo Abatelis is a museum in Palermo. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm quite ignorant. So that's all for now from all. Dale, thank you. And thank I, you very much. I give the floor to Giovanni for greetings. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>